Atler, slash ash till slash or slash tl slash fl. 434 to 453, frequently referred to as Atler the Hun, was the ruler of the Huns from 434 until his death in March 453. Atler was a leader of the Hunnic Empire which stretched from the Ural River to the Rhine River and from the Danube River to the Baltic Sea. During his reign, he was one of the most feared enemies of the Western and Eastern Roman empires. He crossed the Danube twice and plundered the Balkans, but was unable to take Constantinople. His unsuccessful campaign in Persia was followed in 441 by an invasion of the Eastern Roman Empire the success of which emboldened Hitler to invade the West. He also attempted to conquer Roman Gaul modern France, crossing the Rhine in 451 and marching as far as Orleanum, Orleans, before being defeated at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains. He subsequently invaded Italy, devastating the northern provinces, but was unable to take Rome. He planned for further campaigns against the Romans but died in 453. While there is no surviving first-hand account of Atlas' appearance, there is a possible second-hand source provided by Jordanes, who cites a description given by Priscus. Short of stature, with a broad chest and a large head, his eyes were small, his beard thin and sprinkled with grey, and he had a flat nose and tanned skin, showing evidence of his origin. Some modern scholars have suggested that this description is typically East Asian, because it has all the combined features that fits the physical type of people from Eastern Asia and that Atla's ancestors may have come from there. Etymology The origin of the name Atla is unclear. Menander used the term Atla as the name of the Volga River. Pritzak considers it to mean universal ruler in a Turkic language related to Danube Bulgarian. The Turkologist Toto J. Menchen Health and rejects a Turkic etymology, and suggests an East Germanic origin. Atla is formed from Gothic or Jepidakata, father, by means of the diminutive suffix Sila. He finds Pritzak's etymology ingenious but for many reasons unacceptable. However, he suggests that these names were not the true names of the Hun princes and lords. What we have are Hunnic names in Germanic dress, modified to fit the Gothic tongue, or popular Gothic etymologies, or both. Mikola thought Tatler might go back to Turkish Atlig, famous, Poucher finds in it Tokarian Atar. Hero. The first etymology is too far-fetched to be taken seriously. The second is nonsense. The name of Atlas' brother Blida is also of Germanic origin. Judging by a hypothetical Germanic etymology of Atlas' name and the status of Gothic and the lingua franca at his court, historian Peter Heather states that the possibility of Atla being of Germanic ancestry cannot be ruled out. The name has many variants in modern languages, at Lee and Atl in Norse. Atla slash Atla slash Atla in Hungarian, Atla is the most popular, Etzel in German, Nyblunge Lied, Atla, Attila, Attila or Atla in Turkish, and Adil and Edil in Kazakh or Adil, same, similar, or Edil, to use, in Mongolian. Historiography and Source The historiography of Atla is faced with a major challenge, in that the only complete sources are written in Greek and Latin by the enemies of the Huns. His contemporaries left many testimonials of his life, but only fragments of these remain. Briscus, a Roman diplomat and a historian who wrote in Greek, was both a witness to and an actor in the story of Atla, as a member of the embassy of Theodosius II at the Hunnic court in 449. Although he was obviously biased by his political position, his writing is a major source for the life of Atla and he is the only person known to have recorded a physical description of him. He was the author of a history of the late Roman Empire in eight books covering the period from 430 to 476. Today we have only fragments of this work, but it was cited extensively by the 6th century historians Procopius and Jordanes especially in Jordanes The Origin and Deeds of the Goths. As it contains numerous references to Priscus's history, it is an important source of information about the Hunnic Empire and its neighbors. Here, he describes the legacy of Atla and the Hunnic people for a century after Atla's death. Marcellinus comes, a chancellor of Justinian during the same era also describes the relations between the Huns and the Eastern Roman Empire. Numerous ecclesiastical writings contain useful albeit scattered information, 
sometimes difficult to authenticate or distorted by years of hand copying between the 6th and 17th centuries. The Hungarian writers of the 12th century, wishing to portray the Huns in a positive light as their glorious ancestors, repressed certain historical elements and added their own legends. The literature and knowledge of the Huns themselves was transmitted solely orally, by means of epics and chanted poems that were handed down from generation to generation. Indirectly, fragments of this oral history have reached us via the literature of the Scandinavians and Germans, neighbors of the Huns who wrote between the 9th and 13th centuries. Atla is a major character in many medieval epics, such as the Nibelungen Lied, as well as various Eddas and Sagas. Archaeological investigation has uncovered some details about the lifestyle, art and the warfare of the Huns. There are a few traces of battles and sieges, but today the tomb of Atla and the location of his capital have not yet been found. The Huns were a group of Eurasian nomads, appearing from east of the Volga, who migrated into Europe c. 370 and built up an enormous empire there. Their main military techniques were mounted archery and javelin throwing. They were possibly the descendants of the Xungnu, Xiongnu, who had been northern neighbors of China 300 years before and maybe the first expansion of Turkic people across Eurasia. Even though they were in the process of developing settlements before their arrival in Europe, the Huns were a society of pastoral warriors whose primary form of nourishment was meat and milk, products of their herds. The origin and language of the Huns has been the subject of debate for centuries. According to some theories, their leaders at least may have spoken a Turkic language, perhaps closest to the modern Chuvash language. One scholar suggests a relationship to Yenayan. According to the Encyclopedia of European Peoples, the Huns especially those who migrated to the west, may have been a combination of Central Asian Turkic, Mongolic, and Ugruk stocks. Atla's father, Munzuk, was the brother of the kings Okta and Rujla, who reigned jointly over the Hunnic Empire in the early 5th century. This form of diarchy was recurrent with the Huns, but historians are unsure whether it was institutionalized, merely customary, or an occasional occurrence. His family was from a noble lineage but it is uncertain whether they constituted a royal dynasty. Atla's birth date is not known, but the journalist Eric D. Scott and the writer Hermann Schreiber have proposed a date of however, the historian Yaroslav Lebedinsky and archaeologist Katalin Escher prefer an estimate between the 390s and the first decade of the 5th century. Atla grew up in a rapidly changing world. His people were nomads who had only recently arrived in Europe. After crossing the Volga River during the 370s and annexing the territory of the Alans, they attacked the Gotha Kingdom between the Carpathian Mountains and the Danube. They were a very mobile people whose mounted archers had acquired a reputation of invincibility, and the Germanic tribes seemed unable to withstand them. Vast populations fleeing the Huns moved from Germania into the Roman Empire in the west and south, and along the banks of the Rhine and Danube. In 376, the Goths crossed the Danube, initially submitting to the Romans but soon rebelling against the Emperor Valens whom they killed in the Battle of Adrianople in 378. On December 31, 406, to escape the Huns, large numbers of Vandals, Alans, Subi and Burgundians crossed the Rhine and invaded Roman Gaul. The Roman Empire had been split into half since 395 and was ruled by two distinct governments, one based in Ravenna in the west, and the other in Constantinople in the east. In Atlas' lifetime, Despite several power struggles, the Roman emperors both east and west were generally from the same family, the Theodosians. The Huns dominated a vast territory with nebulous borders determined by the will of a constellation of ethnically varied peoples. Some were assimilated to Hunnic nationality, whereas many retained their own identities and rulers but acknowledged the suzerainty of the king of the Huns. While the Huns were the indirect source of many of the Romans' problems by driving various Germanic tribes into Roman territory, relations between the two empires were cordial. The Romans used the Huns as mercenaries against the Germans and even in their civil wars. Thus, the usurper Joan was able to recruit thousands of Huns for his army against Valentinian III in 424. It was Aetius, later patrician of the West, who managed this operation. They exchanged ambassadors and hostages, 
the alliance lasting from 401 to 450 and permitting the Romans numerous military victories. The Huns considered the Romans to be paying them tribute, whereas the Romans preferred to view this as payment for services rendered. By the time Attila came of age during the reign of his uncle Rudla, the Huns had become a great power, to the point that the Patriarch of Constantinople, Nestorius, deplored the situation with these words. They have become both masters and slaves of the Romans. The death of Rugla, also known as Ruoruga, in 434 left the sons of his brother Munzuk, Atla and Bliga, Buda, in control of the United Hun tribes. At the time of two brothers' accession, the Hun tribes were bargaining with Eastern Roman Emperor Theodosius II's envoys for the return of several renegades, possibly Hunnic nobles who disagreed with the brothers' assumption of leadership who had taken refuge within the Eastern Roman Empire. The following year Atla and Blida met with the imperial legation at Margus, Poserevac, and, all seated on horseback in the Hunnic manner, negotiated a successful treaty. The Romans agreed, not only to return the fugitives, but also to double their previous tribute of 350 Roman pounds, c. 115 kilograms, of gold, to open their markets to Hunnish traders and to pay a ransom of eight solidi for each Roman taken prisoner by the Huns. The Huns, satisfied with the treaty, decamped from the Roman Empire and returned to their home in the great Hungarian plain, perhaps to consolidate and strengthen their empire. Theodosius used this opportunity to strengthen the walls of Constantinople, building the city's first sea wall, and to build up his border defences along the Danube. The Huns remained out of Roman sight for the next few years while they invaded the Sassanid Empire. When defeated in Armenia by the Sassanids, the Huns abandoned their invasion and turned their attentions back to Europe. In 440 they reappeared in force on the borders of the Roman Empire, attacking the merchants at the market on the north bank of the Danube that had been established by the treaty. Crossing the Danube, they laid waste to the cities of Illyricum and forts on the river, including, according to Priscus, Vimanasium, a city of Msia. Their advance began at Margus, where they demanded that the Romans turn over a bishop who had retained property that Adler regarded as his. While the Romans discussed turning the bishop over, he slipped away secretly to the Huns and betrayed the city to them. While the Huns attacked city-states along the Danube, the Vandals led by Gai Zarek captured the western Roman province of Africa and its capital of Carthage. Carthage was the richest province of the Western Empire and a main source of food for Rome. The Sassanid Shah Yazdeh II invaded Armenia in 441. The Romans stripped the Balkan area of forces, sending them to Sicily in order to mount an expedition against the Vandals in Africa. This left Tatla and Blida a clear path through Illyricum into the Balkans which they invaded in 441. The Hunnish army sacked Margus and Vimanasium, and then took Sinidunum, Belgrade, and Sirmium. During 442 Theodosius recalled his troops from Sicily and ordered a large issue of new coins to finance operations against the Huns. Believing he could defeat the Huns, he refused the Hunnish king's demands. Etla responded with a campaign in 443, striking along the Danube, the Huns equipped with new military weapons like the battering rams and rolling siege towers, overran the military centers of Ratiara and successfully besieged Nasus, Niz. Advancing along the Nisava River, the Huns next took Serdica, Sophia, Philippopolis, Plovdiv, and Arcadiopolis, Leulburgas. They encountered and destroyed a Roman army outside Constantinople but were stopped by the double walls of the eastern capital. They defeated a second army near Calipolis, Chilabalu. Theodosius, stripped of his armed forces, admitted defeat, sending the Magister Militum per Orientum and Italius to negotiate peace terms. The terms were harsher than the previous treaty. The Emperor agreed to hand over 6,000 Roman pounds, c. 2,000 kilograms, of gold as punishment for having disobeyed the terms of the treaty during the invasion. The yearly tribute was tripled, rising to 2,100 Roman pounds, c. 700 kilograms, in gold, and the ransom for each Roman prison rose to 12 solidi. Their demands were met for a time. The Hun kings withdrew into the interior of their empire. Following the Huns' withdrawal from Byzantium, 
probably around 445, Blida died. Atla then took the throne for himself, becoming the sole ruler of the Huns. Solitary kingship. In 447 Atla again rode south into the eastern Roman Empire through Msia. The Roman army under the Gothic magister Militamangisclus met him in the Battle of the Utius and was defeated though not without inflicting heavy losses. The Huns were left unopposed and rampaged through the Balkans as far as Thermopylae. Constantinople itself was saved by the Isaurian troops of the Magister Militum per Orientum Zeno and protected by the intervention of the prefect Constantinus, who organized the reconstruction of the walls that had been previously damaged by earthquakes, and, in some places, to construct a new line of fortification in front of the old. An account of this invasion survives. The barbarian nation of the Huns, which was in Thrace, became so great that more than a hundred cities were captured and Constantinople almost came into danger and most men fled from it. Dot. And there were so many murders and bloodlettings that the dead could not be numbered. A for they took captive the churches and the monasteries and slew the monks and maidens in great numbers. Callinicus, in his life of Saint Hypatius, in the west the general path of the Hun forces in the invasion of Gaul. In 450 Atla proclaimed his intent to attack the Visigoth kingdom of Toulouse by making an alliance with Emperor Valentinian III. He had previously been on good terms with the Western Roman Empire and its influential general Flavius Aetius. Aetius had spent a brief exile among the Huns in 433 and the troops Atla provided against the Goths and Bagordi had helped earn him the largely honorary title of Magister Militum in the West. The gifts and diplomatic efforts of Gay Isaric, who opposed and feared the Visigoths, may also have influenced Atla's plans. However, Valentinian's sister was Honoria, who, in order to escape her forced betrothal to a Roman senator, had sent the Hunnish king a plea for help, and her engagement ring. In the spring of 450, though Honoria may not have intended a proposal of marriage, Atla chose to interpret her message as such. He accepted, asking for half of the Western Empire as dowry. When Valentinian discovered the plan, only the influence of his mother Gila Placidia convinced him to exile, rather than kill, Honoria. He also wrote to Atla strenuously denying the legitimacy of the supposed marriage proposal. Atlas sent an emissary to Ravenna to proclaim that Honoria was innocent, that the proposal had been legitimate, and that he would come to claim what was rightfully his. Atla the Hun on horseback by George S. Stewart. Atla interfered in a succession struggle after the death of a Frankish ruler. Atla supported the elder son, while Aetius supported the younger. The location and identity of these kings is not known and subject to conjecture. Atla gathered his vassals, Jepids, Ostrogoths. Rugians, Syrians, Herules, Thurinans, Alans, Burgundians, among others and began his march west. In 451 he arrived in Belgica with an army exaggerated by Jordanes to half a million strong. J. B. Berry believes that Atlas' intent, by the time he marched west, was to extend his kingdom, already the strongest on the continent across Gaul to the Atlantic Ocean. On April 7 he captured Metz. Other cities attacked can be determined by the hagiographic vitae written to commemorate their bishops. Nicasius was slaughtered before the altar of his church in Reims. Servatus is alleged to have saved Tongeren with his prayers, as Saint Genevieve is to have saved Paris. Lupus, Bishop of Troyes, is also credited with saving his city by meeting Atla in person. Aetius moved to oppose Atla gathering troops from among the Franks, the Burgundians, and the Celts. A mission by Avitus, and Atlas continued westward advance, convinced the Visigoth king Theodoric I, Theodrid, to ally with the Romans. The combined armies reached Orleans ahead of Atla, thus checking and turning back the Hunnish advance. Later accounts of the battle report that the Huns were either already within the city or in the midst of storming it when the Roman Visigoth army arrived. Jordanes mentions no such thing, Aetius gave chase and caught the Huns at a place usually assumed to be near Cattle Ornum, modern Chilens and Champagne. The two armies clashed in the Battle of Chilens, whose outcome is commonly considered to be a strategic victory for the Visigothic Roman alliance. Theodoric was killed in the fighting and Aetius failed to press his advantage, according to Edward Gibbon and Edward Greasy. 
because he feared the consequences of an overwhelming Visigothic triumph as much as he did a defeat. From Misha's point of view, the best outcome was what occurred, Theodoric died, Attila was in retreat and disarray, and the Romans had the benefit of appearing victorious. Invasion of Italy and death Attila returned in 452 to claim his marriage to Honoria anew invading and ravaging Italy along the way. The city of Venice was founded as a result of these attacks when the residents fled to small islands in the Venetian lagoon. His army sacked numerous cities and razed Aquileia so completely that it was afterwards hard to recognize its original site. Legend has it he had his soldiers carry dirt in their helmets to build a hill north of Aquileia from which he could watch the destruction of the city, thus founding the town of Udine where a castle now stands on the legendary hill. Isis, who lacked the strength to offer battle, managed to harass and slow Atla's advance with only a shadow force. Atla finally halted at the river Po. By this point disease and starvation may have broken out in Atla's camp, thus helping to stop his invasion. Emperor Valentinian III sent three envoys, the high civilian officers Genadius of Ianus and Trigitius, as well as the bishop of Rome Leo I who met Atla at Mincio in the vicinity of Mantua, and obtained from him the promise that he would withdraw from Italy and negotiate peace with the Emperor. Prosper of Aquitaine gives a short description of the historic meeting, but gives all the credit of the successful negotiation to Leo. Priscus reports that superstitious fear of the fate of Alaric, who died shortly after sacking Rome in 410, gave him pause. In reality, Italy had suffered from a terrible famine in 451 and her crops were faring little better in 452. Atlas' devastating invasion of the plains of northern Italy this year did not improve the harvest. To advance on Rome would have required supplies which were not available in Italy, and taking the city would not have improved Atlas' supply situation. Therefore, it was more profitable for Atla to conclude peace and retreat back to his homeland. Secondly, an East Roman force had crossed the Danube under the command of another officer also named Aetius, who had participated in the Council of Chalced in the previous year, and proceeded to defeat the Huns who had been left behind by Atla to safeguard their home territories. Atla, hence, faced heavy human and natural pressures to retire from Italy without ever setting foot south of the Po. As Hydatius writes in his Chronica Minora, the Huns who had been plundering Italy and who had also stormed a number of cities, were victims of divine punishment, being visited with heaven-sent disasters, famine and some kind of disaster. In addition, they were slaughtered by auxiliaries sent by the Emperor Marcin and led by Aetius. At the same time, they were crushed in their, home, settlements. Thus crushed, they made peace with the Romans and all retired to their homes. Hydatius, Kriminitz, 2 pp. 26 ff. The Huns, led by Atla, invade Italy, Atla, the Scourge of God, by Alpiano Checa, as reproduced in Beacon Lights of History, Volume 4 by John Lord. After Atla left Italy and returned to his palace across the Danube, he planned to strike at Constantinople again and reclaim the tribute which Marcin had stopped. Marcin was the successor of Theodosius and had ceased paying tribute in late 450. While Atla was occupied in the west, multiple invasions by the Huns and others had left the Balkans with little to plunder. However, Atla died in the early months of 453. The conventional account, from Priscus says that at a feast celebrating his latest marriage to the beautiful and young Ildico, if uncorrupted, the name suggests a Gothic, more likely Ostrogoth origin, he suffered a severe nosebleed and choked to death in a stupor. An alternative theory is that he succumbed to internal bleeding after heavy drinking, possibly a condition called esophageal varices, where dilated veins in the lower part of the esophagus rupture leading to death by hemorrhage. Another account of his death first recorded 80 years after the events by the Roman chronicler Marcellinus comes, reports that Atla, king of the Huns and ravager of the provinces of Europe, was pierced by the hand and blade of his wife. The Volsunga Saga and the poetic Edda also claim that King Atli, Atla, died at the hands of his wife, Gudrun. Most scholars reject these accounts as no more than hearsay, preferring instead the account given by Atla's contemporary Priscus. Priscus' version, however, 
has recently come under renewed scrutiny by Michael A. Babcock. Based on detailed philological analysis, Babcock concludes that the account of natural death, given by Priscus, was an ecclesiastical cover story in that Emperor Marcin, who ruled the Eastern Roman Empire from 450 to 457, was the political force behind Adler's death. Jordan says, the greatest of all warriors should be mourned with no feminine lamentations and with no tears, but with the blood of men. His horsemen galloped in circles around the silken tent where Adler lay in state, singing in his dirge, according to Cassiodorus and Jordanes, who can rate this as death, when none believes it calls for vengeance. Then they celebrated a strava, lamentation over his burial place with great feasting. Legend says that he was laid to rest in a triple coffin made of gold, silver, and iron, along with some of the spoils of his conquests. His men diverted a section of the river, buried the coffin under the riverbed, and then were killed to keep the exact location a secret. His son Zerlak, his appointed successor, Dengizic, and Arnak fought over the division of his legacy specifically which vassal kings would belong to which brother. As a consequence, they were divided, defeated, and scattered the following year in the Battle of Nedau, by the Ostrogoths and the Jepids under Ardaric, who had been Atlas' most prized chieftain. Atlas' many children and relatives are known by name and some even by deeds, but soon valid genealogical sources all but dried up and there seems to be no verifiable way to trace Atlas' descendants. This has not stopped many genealogists from attempting to reconstruct a valid line of descent for various medieval rulers. One of the most credible claims has been that of the Khans of Bulgaria, see nominalia of the Bulgarian Khans. A popular, but ultimately unconfirmed, attempt tries to relate Atlas to Charlemagne, later folklore and iconography. Atlas himself is said to have claimed the title's descendant of the great Nimrod, and king of the Huns, the Goths, the Danes, and the Meds the last two peoples being mentioned to show the extent of his control over subject nations even on the peripheries of his domain. Jordanes embellished the report of Priscus, reporting that Atla had possessed the holy war sword of the Scythians, which was given to him by Mars and made him a prince of the entire world. Atla was the standard source of legitimacy on the European steppe until Genghis Khan. By the end of the 12th century the royal court of Hungary proclaimed their descent from Atla. Lampot of Hersfeld's contemporary chronicles report that shortly before the year 1071, the sword of Atla had been presented to Otto of Nordheim by the exiled Queen of Hungary, Anastasia of Kiev. This sword, a cavalry sabre now in the Kunsthistorisches an anonymous chronicler of the medieval period represented the meeting of Pope Leo and Attila as attended also by Saint Peter and Saint Paul, a miraculous tale calculated to meet the taste of the time. This apotheosis was later portrayed artistically by the Renaissance artist Raphael and sculptor Algadi, whom 18th century historian Edward Gibbon praised for establishing one of the noblest legends of ecclesiastical tradition. According to a version of this narrative related in the Chronicon Pictum, a medieval Hungarian chronicle, the Pope promised Tatla that if he left Rome in peace, one of his successors would receive a holy crown, which has been understood as referring to the holy crown of Hungary. Some histories and chronicles describe him as a great and noble king and he plays major roles in three Norse sagas, Adlarkvitha, Volsunga saga, and Adlaml. The Polish chronicle represents Settler's name as Aquila. Frutolf of Michelsburg and Otto of Frey Ising pointed out that some songs as vulgar fables made Theodoric the Great, Atla and Ermanaric contemporaries, when any reader of Jordanes knew that this was not the case. In 1812, Ludwig van Beethoven conceived the idea of writing an opera about Adler and approached August von Kotzbue to write the libretto. It was, however, never written. In World War I, Allied propaganda referred to Germans as the Huns, based on a 1900 speech by Emperor Wilhelm II praising Adler the Huns' military prowess. According to Jawaharlal Nehru's Glimpses of World History, Der Spiegel commented on November 6, 1948 that the sword of Atla was hanging menacingly over Austria. American writer Cecilia Holland wrote The Death of Atla, 1973, a historical novel in which Atla appears as a powerful background figure whose life and death deeply impact the protagonists, a young Hunnish warrior and a Germanic one. In modern Hungary and in Turkey, 
Atla and its Turkish variation Attila are commonly used as a male first name. In Hungary, several public places are named after Atla, for instance, in Budapest there are ten Atla streets, one of which island an important street behind the Buda castle. When the Turkish armed forces invaded Cyprus in 1974, the operations were named after Atla. The Atla Plan, the 1954 Universal International Film Sign of the Pagan Star Jack Palance as Atla.